Your Excellencies, esteemed guests, welcome to the session where we'll be discussing everything from investments to trade to FDIs and to policy making. I would pick up from where right yes, I left it. Too much has changed. Too much has changed to return to the status quo, and too much has changed to do things in terms of investments the same way we did before. I would throw in some numbers from, for you to, to, to know where we stand right now. During the 2020, FDIs, or foreign direct investments, has gone down by staggering 42%. Uh, this is much worse than the fall we've witnessed right after the financial crisis in 2008-2009. We stand at 859 billion, uh, whereas in 2019 we were at 1.5 trillion dollars in terms of FDIs. So there's a lot of questions we would like to address. As I said, we're going to focus on trade, investments, FDI, and especially policy making. Please join me to welcome uh, my esteemed uh, guest panelists, His Excellency Khalid bin Abdul Aziz Al Falih, Minister of Investments, Her Excellency Dr. Rania Al Mashat, Minister of International Cooperations from Egypt, and uh, Lord Grimstone of Boscobel, Minister from Investments from the United Kingdom. Virtually, we have two esteemed guests. From Dubai, we're joined by His Excellency Sultan Ahmed bin Slayim. He's the group chairman and CEO of DP World. And Eric Cantor from New York. Uh, he's the vice chairman and managing director of Mollis Mollis Company. I will start with you, uh, Khaled. Uh, you are now the Minister of Investment. You've been working on a new strategy. FDI play a big role in the Vision 2030. Share with us the Saudi story. Saudi is very, very interested to lure and attract investments in different sectors, to diversify the economy, and to push the GDP forward. Well, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon to everybody who's here with us physically. Good morning to you, Eric, and uh, uh, good afternoon to uh, the rest of the guests especially Sultan from uh, Dubai. It's an honor to be at the FII again. This is indeed becoming uh, a global hub for communication and uh, networking. Even when uh, COVID gets in the way, we're doing it in a very creative way. So my compliments to uh, Yasser and his colleagues at the FII Institute. Uh, you painted, and, and the panel before you, somewhat of a gloomy picture. So let me start with an optimistic note, uh, a lesson in history. A uh, hundred years ago, the world experienced a similar pandemic with the Spanish flu. Uh, and after that, uh, we're still benefiting from the boom that happened in the day, decade after, which is the roaring 20s. So I'm starting this year, and I'm speaking at this conference with, with, with a lot of enthusiasm, cautiously, of course, because there has been uh, setbacks and there have been hurt and there have been uh, a lot of suffering as a result uh, of COVID and we've internalized the lessons and built capacity and taken the resilience that has been proven in many sectors mm -hmm. in the kingdom and indeed in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia overall as fuel to take on, uh, take on uh, the opportunities uh, that, are, that are ahead. Uh, I think 2020 was a, a confluence of a number of trends. There was, of course, a secular trend that had started some time back with shifts in consumptions, uh, technology, overcapacity built in some sectors, by periods of investments that preceded us uh, the last few decades. We had, of course, the, the trade tensions and their impact in terms of shifting uh, corporate strategies on supply chain, reshoring, uh, uh, and regionalization versus globalization, uh, as well as perceptions that the nationalism that was taking hold in some uh, in some geographies and some jurisdictions was also presenting many, many companies with, with the need to pause and, and reconsider how they're going to rig their, their supply chains and their, 
uh, their investment. And of course, we had the cyclical impact of the healthcare crisis, the pandemic, and its impact on supply demand, and we saw yeah. some sectors shaking. All of this, of course, has slowed down, and it figures you mentioned uh, NFDI are global. I am pleased to say that in Saudi Arabia, actually, uh, foreign direct investment went up in 2020 uh, over 2019. Uh, I think the, 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 the pandemic has brought to, to the fore the capacity of certain countries, certain governments, certain policy makers yeah. that, that could manage multiple crises at the same time, a health crisis, an economic slowdown, safety and well-being, balancing lives and livelihoods, and showcasing who are the governments, yes. who are the countries, who are the policy makers that could provide uh, security to the investors as well as the population. So if you ask about Saudi Arabia, I believe we handled it better than most. Yes. And I think that is giving, ultimately, investors w want to trust the government that is looking after them. And I believe Saudi Arabia, we'll, through our leadership, has shown that. We'll come back to the sectors and the uh, policy making that Saudi is also focusing on. Dr. Rania, what we've noticed in the past, in the cu last couple of years, that there was this sort of dependence. Every single country wants its work, its way out, regardless of the others. What COVID brought as an advantage is the comeback of interdependence, comeback of uh, uh, the diplomacy in economics and business. You speak a lot about that. Um, is, has this become so important now and there is no way we can go back to the way we used to see things happening in the last few years? Well, thank you very much. I'm very uh, happy to be here, and I want to congratulate uh, PIF and FII for, uh, for hosting all of us uh, physically who are here. Um, absolutely. At the beginning of uh, 2020, there was uh, a lot of rhetoric around uh, countries being more isolated uh, and that everyone on their own. But as uh, April came along, May came along, uh, the importance uh, of collaboration, the importance of multilateralism came, came back to the fore in a very forceful manner. Uh, but it's multilateralism uh, with innovation. Uh, in the portfolio that I handle, which is the Ministry of International Cooperation, we try to promote and foster principles uh, of economic diplomacy. And the idea is to actually push forward more international partnerships. And to give examples, uh, the portfolio that we handle, which includes uh, very important projects across different sectors in the country, transportation, renewable energy, SMEs, uh, health sector, uh, etc., are all done with international institutions. And as uh, was mentioned in the earlier panel, uh, today financing and the cost of financing is something that uh, different companies and different countries are looking very closely at. Development financing is a very important uh, source. It's one that uh, is lower in cost and it's one that uh, provides longer terms of paying back. And therefore, uh, countries that are interested to distinguish themselves uh, need to provide uh, a very important opportunity, not just for their sovereign projects, but also for the private sector, whether domestic or foreign, to be able to be tap on these bankable projects, come in and find uh, the uh, acceptable uh, terms of financing through development uh, partners. Um, in 2020, despite it being a very uh, tough year, uh, through our principles of economic diplomacy, we've been able to secure close to $10 billion uh, across different sectors in Egypt. Uh, and let me say that um, one of the other fears at the beginning of 2020 uh, was that the sustainable development goals uh, and that agenda was going to be a little bit uh, an afterthought. And what was very, very uh, uh, timely and uh, quite critical is that the 17 SDGs uh, became uh, quite tangible on an individual level, on a country yes. level, on a firm level. And today you find different uh, companies talking about ESG principles and so forth. So countries that really want uh, to be able uh, to attract uh, investments uh, need to be mindful uh, of these global principles uh, in, in, in putting their uh, policies together. This will bring me to a question that uh, I think it's keen under DP word uh, operations and it is infrastructure connectivity. Uh, Mr. Sultan, could you share with us your reflection on, on the COVID challenge? Keeping trade flowing was something very, very important during the pandemic, especially during 2020.
is on uh, mute. We're not, we, we can't hear you. Okay, I think I'm gonna move on to the next questions. Uh, Jerry, mind me if I call you Jerry. Tough 2020, tough year we had last year. Uh, there's a strong need for recapitalization. How can we achieve that through investments and trade? Well, it's a, look, it's a very good question. I mean, in my lifetime, this is the first time that we're faced with the need for a global recapitalization. We've had regional recaps, we've had sector recaps, we've had company recaps, but this is the first time the whole world has been hit simultaneously. And it is that simultaneous hit which I think is so important. So how have us policymakers responded? Well, we've flooded the world with virtually free leverage. And that's a different world to the world that we knew before. So how are we going to get ourselves out of this? And my view quite clearly is that it's going to be trade and investment which pull the world out of this. And, and we have to absolutely hit back on protectionism. Already, we're seeing that some countries think the answer is to pull themselves into themselves. That is not the answer. And certainly, the United Kingdom, we're now completely in charge of our own trade policy. We will be arguing for open markets. And for investment, investment has become one of the world's most globally competitive sports to attract investment. We're all raising our game. We're all trying to attract investment. And how are we going to do this? It's getting into the minds of the investor. What does the investor want to invest in? And what difficulties is he, is he finding? And under the leadership of our Prime Minister, we've opened a specific office for investment in 10 Downing Street, whose sole purpose is to make it easy for global investors to access the United Kingdom. And I think that has to be the way forward. Okay. Um, Eric, Mollis has been very, very active in the region. Uh, you're an advisory company, again, investments banking. I would like to hear from you. What are the global trends that we need to consider uh, that this region also should be, should, should be considering? Uh, well, Fatima, thank you. And Khalid, it's a pleasure to be here and share the panel with you and these other esteemed guests. I also want to thank uh, PIF Yasser and his team uh, for pulling us off in this very challenging time. Uh, but, you know, there, there is, uh, I think, a, a great opportunity for us coming off of this uh, very unusual and challenging year of 2020. Uh, I just look to the region that you sit in, in the Gulf, and it seems to me that the, res the correct response to 2020 and all that we've been through is the vision inherent in the Crown Prince's Vision 2030. Uh, the reason why I think MOLAS has committed itself uh, to the region in the way it has is it sees so much opportunity uh, because uh, folks uh, in the government uh, in the kingdom have said we need and we want outside investment. And uh, Khalid, you spoke of some of the things that uh, had occurred in the kingdom when the pandemic hit. Uh, and the moves that were made uh, to make sure that multinationals that were present uh, were acknowledged and their importance accepted in terms of this global value, uh, value chain that exists. Now, unfortunately, just as um, uh, uh, Lord, Lord Grimstone had indicated in the UK, the same thing going on here in the US. There is a tremendous push to try and pull in rather than to look outward and to resume this global connectedness that we all know ultimately can, can lead to better life and growth for all of us. Uh, but I will say, um, you know, given the sort of trade disruptions that the pandemic has caused, as well as the policy bent in, in Washington of the last administration, we have all begun to take stock of where our critical and strategic industries are why aren't they here at home? And why is it that we're relying on potential uh, uh, countries who may not see our interests first in order to provide us with those uh, critical goods and services? I mean, just remember, it wasn't too long ago that we all were desperate to find more masks and protective equipment for the pandemic. 
So I do think that those are the trends that are impacting on the policy level and on the investment level, uh, the steps that have been taken by countries uh, to ensure that they invite in investment, that they have certainty for the investor, stability um, of expectations. Uh, I think that, that we can all begin to resume a, a much more normal course of international investment and foreign investment. This brings me back to Sultan. I would like to hear from you how important has become the uh, connectivity in terms of infrastructure. One key thing that governments worked hard day and night is to keep trade and supply chain flowing. Absolutely. Uh, last year, when I said that connectivity would be at the heart of the region, uh, economic success. And this will be critical to achieving uh, Saudi Arabia 2030 vision. Uh, connectivity includes uh, not just infrastructure, it is people, technology, and talent. And I tell you, during the pandemic, we learned so much about technology. We were caught in a, in a situation where we can't mix with people. We accelerated many platforms uh, during the pandemic. We had no choice, and that helped us. Actually, with the pandemic, which is one of the great things about it, that we really worked so hard in developing new technologies that allowed us to connect with everybody. Connectivity is very important. Supply chains are shifting. Uh, Reshoring is increasing. Interregional trade flows are more important than ever. Uh, the region is ready to take advantage. I think what, what happened in 2020 uh, gave us an experience, uh, a challenge, we never hear, have seen before. We learn how to cope with it and deal with it. Uh, we never allowed any of our ports to be closed. We moved our people to the port to avoid unlocking. But what we did, we made sure we comply with all the sanitation and requirement to save our people. Uh, going forward, I believe that uh, despite what you see in the pandemic today, as more and more uh, cases are happening, actually with the vaccine, we have a big role now in supply chain. We can transport it. And with the vaccine available, this is the end of the pandemic. I will be sharing His Excellency Khad uh, his uh, uh, vision that there is optimism. Uh, what we've been through gave us really uh, strong ability to deal with this. Uh, also, the pandemic taught us that the world can't really be supplied from one source. China became uh, an obstacle when, when it's closed, and people realized. And today, for the region, uh, many companies who are foreign and Chinese who are in China are looking for different areas to produce closer to the market. They really found it is very important to be in different areas for the supply chain to work. And Saudi Arabia is the heart of this. We really, we are developing now uh, jet port investing $500 million, and during the pandemic, we learned what else we can do to make sure that we can react to any challenges we have? Yes. For, uh, Khalid, I'll come back to you. Policy making is key, and the gap that we need to bridge between policy making and investors is still a little bit wide. So you are working on that. You're working on setting up new policies, new regulations that would lure investors in Saudi Arabia. What are these new uh, legal and regulatory frameworks that would support the future of FDIs? Well, you know, first of all, they have to be all directed um, um, to, to addressing the risk uh, return trade-offs that investors have to, have to make. Uh, and any risk that is properly managed and owned by the government should be shifted in that direction versus being left for the investor to worry about and build into their return expectations and therefore make the project more difficult to, uh, uh, to achieve. So. We've looked in the kingdom at over 400 regulations, and half of them have been revamped. The kingdom has made leapfrog in both uh, our position globally and many of the indices, and more will be coming in terms of risk of doing business as well as the ease of doing business. In addition, we have to be specifically focused on the sectors and technologies of tomorrow. And we've seen through COVID the increased importance on biotechnology, 
on information, on data, on digitalization, on logistics, as Sultan mentioned, and the importance. And there are specific regulations that are sector specific that, that looked at IP, that looked at uh, access to data and ownership of, uh, of data that every competitive country in a very competitive world is looking to place themselves uh, at the forefront. And, and of course, the other thing which complements these regulations, the entire eco ecosystem, is, is the infrastructure. And, and that goes into connectivity and, and, and logistics as well. But increasingly, the digital infrastructure is more important than the physical infrastructure and how to regulate it, how to build it, how to make it the platform through which all companies today need, whether they're dealing with manufacturing and advanced manufacturing fourth industrial revolution, whether it's research and development in biotechnology uh, or, or, or uh, e-commerce uh, or logistics. All of these need strong infrastructure in the digital space supported by enabling regulations and that's, that's my number one and my ministry's number one uh, uh, job. Jerry, can we easily bridge the gap between policy making and investors? I have a very clear view of this. You have to bring investors into the heart of policy making. You have to face policy makers with investors and you have to turn all of our investment aspirations into investable projects. Because what do you learn from investors? You learn two things. You learn what they want to invest in, and you also learn what are the barriers to investment. And all of us have an equal job in removing barriers in the same way as we have a job in attracting investment. Uh, Dr. Rania, you're a tech enthusiast, and you do think that digitalization is the way forward, as uh, Khalid mentioned. Um, uh, can you share briefly with us where does Egypt stands on this? So, of course, uh, uh, the biggest experiment on the need for digitalization has been COVID. We, were not, we would not have been able to pass uh, a year with education unless we had done reforms on the education system through digital um, uh, tools. Uh, similarly, uh, the, uh, when we talk about trade, and let me just link digital to trade, um, one of the ways to reduce, uh, reduce cost uh, of trade is through uh, digital platforms, etc. And there have been uh, several measures uh, that have estimated uh, if digital tools are used uh, in trade, we are able to uh, actually increase uh, trade by one to two percentage points over time, and that increases to growth as well. So I believe that uh, there is that opportunity uh, that exists, and um, definitely, uh, as was mentioned by uh, Minister Khalid, uh, the role of the state is to try and look at the regulations quite closely, uh, and just to echo uh, uh, what was mentioned also, uh, having everyone at the table and this concept of uh, stakeholder capitalism where the government, the private sector, civil society, everybody comes together because uh, no one can fulfill the aspirations that the economy wants to reach on their own. So there has to be that uh, dialogue, conducive dialogue, and actually action uh, through predictable policies uh, that the government puts together. Um, Eric, do you agree as a, as, a, as a major player in the region? And what do you think should be done to make this gap smaller between investors and policymakers? Well, I, I absolutely agree that having the investors at the table uh, makes a big difference. Again, uh, in my former life as a policymaker on Capitol Hill, it was always a dangerous thing to have policymakers begin to think that they knew what investors were thinking rather than asking the investors to see what was necessary to bring down those barriers. And I know that in discussions with our clients uh, now at MOLAS, you know, what we're seeing in terms of interest in the region is that there is a signal by the government uh, in the government in the kingdom, UAE and elsewhere uh, in the Gulf that says, please come and we want to see this investment. And if you look at some of the larger trends that are unfolding across the investment universe, obviously we've talked a lot about E and the ESG. Uh, and there's no question that the oil production that occurs in the GCC, and Colin knows this well, having run the biggest company in the industry in the world for many years, um, it, it, they do so, Aramco does so, in the cleanest and most efficient way possible. And ultimately what that's going to do is help manufacturing 
in the region and then allowing that manufacturing to be exported to countries, let's say in the EU, for instance, that is discussing a border adjustment tax for carbon, uh, meaning that if one has a cheaper and more efficient and cleaner production process because of the feedstock and the way it is produced uh, in a certain region like the GCC, they, that manufacturer will necessarily be advantaged uh, in confronting the possibility for end users in the EU. So uh, again, I do think that there's a lot of elements at play here and policies. Uh, it's nice to hear that the policies that, that uh, Khaled is advocating and putting into place uh, will mean a better opportunity for investors. Yes. Sultan, I'll finish with you. Um, your DP words, uh, key interests in 2021. What are your priorities, especially if you're talking about partnership, cross-sector uh, 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 partnership, and also unlocking FDIs in less than a minute? Well, uh, the thing we do now in DP World is end-to-end -end solutions, and we have invested a lot to achieve that. Uh, we are connecting all our ports around the world and we are really reaching the bco the beneficial cargo owner and that is key because during the pandemic we have to deal with them rather than just the shipping line so this is something we will continue to do more to lure them into our area and connect them by giving them advantage throughout our terminal uh, integration Sultan Al Slayim, uh, Group Chairman and CEO of DP World. Eric Cantor, Vice Chairman, Managing Director of Mollis Company, joined me from New York. DP World, of course, from Dubai. His Excellency Khaled Al Faleh, the Investment Minister, Saudi Arabia. Dr. Rani Al Mashat, the um, Minister of International Cooperation, and also Lord. Um, uh, Grimstone of Boscobel, Minister of Investment from the United Kingdom. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, watching us and thank you for joining us. And uh, you might remain seated because we have a special address shortly.